In the third part of the lecture about rotation, I will discuss the rotational analogues to kinetic energy and linear momentum. I will also introduce the concept of center of mass. Let's first talk about rotational kinetic energy. Consider this car wheel, which is moving to the right with some velocity v. We know that since the car wheel has some mass m, that the car wheel will possess kinetic energy which is calculated as the product of the mass of the wheel times the speed to the second power divided by 2. But at the same time, as the wheel is moving along a straight line like so, it is also rotating. Which means that the wheel possesses some angular velocity and part of the energy that the wheel has must be used towards rotation. So some of the energy is used for translation and that is the kinetic energy of the wheel. However, some of the energy must be going towards rotation because that process takes also some energy. So what kind of energy is that? This is known as rotational kinetic energy. Kinetic energy of rotation. Kinetic energy of rotation is defined as the product of the moment of inertia of the rotating body times the angular velocity to the second power divided by 2. As we discussed before, the moment of inertia for rotation is analog to the mass for translation. And of course, the angular velocity is analog to the linear velocity. And so then the kinetic energy of an object that is rolling, which means there is translational motion and rotational motion together, the kinetic energy of rolling motion is defined as the kinetic energy of translation mv squared divided by 2 plus the kinetic energy of rotation i omega squared divided by 2. When an object is in pure rotational motion, imagine the car was lifted and the wheel is rotating but the car is not um, moving in any direction. In this case, the wheel only possesses kinetic energy of rotation, I omega squared divided by 2. Angular momentum is the analog to linear momentum, but for rotational motion. By definition, the angular momentum of a rotating object is calculated as the product of the object's moment, moment of inertia and angular velocity. The angular momentum we label with capital L, and that is equal to the product of the object's moment of inertia and angular velocity. The units for angular momentum would be kilograms times meters squared per second. Just like for linear momentum, we talked about conservation of linear momentum, which stated that for a system that is not under the action of a non-zero net force. The linear momentum is conserved at all times. For a rotating object that is not under the action of non-zero net torque, the angular momentum is conserved. This statement can be generalized for a system of objects that is rotating. And the statement then is that if the net external torque on a rotating system is zero, the angular momentum of that system is conserved. The 
common example that um, many of you may be familiar with is a, a figure skater who is spinning in place. When the figure skater has her arms stretched out, she is rotating with slower angular velocity. But when she brings her arms in closer to her body, she will then spin with faster angular velocity. The reason for that change is that her moment of inertia changes based on how her mass is distributed with respect to the axis of rotation of her body. And since the angular momentum is conserved due to the very little friction, and ideally we can assume no friction, then if the angular momentum decreases, the angular velocity will, will increase, or if the angular, if the moment of inertia increases, then the angular velocity will decrease. Another example of conservation of angular momentum is the process of a cat falling on her paws. So you know, all know that we all know that if a cat is being held above, the, you know, the floor um, with her feet up and we let go, the cat actually lands on her paws. Why is that? Well, because of conservation of angular momentum. So as the cat is falling, she would turn half of her body facing towards the ground. So let's say the front of her body, the paws face the ground. And because angular momentum must be conserved for the cat as a whole, the back legs will also turn towards um, the ground. And so the cat lands on her, on her paws. There is another definition for angular momentum, which involves a point particle. For a point particle, The angular momentum is calculated as the product of the linear momentum of that point particle and times the distance from a fixed point in space. So for example, we have a point in space, point A, and then we have a particle with some mass m traveling with velocity v along this straight line. So then the linear, mo uh, the angular momentum of this point particle with respect to this point will be the product of the momentum of the particle, mv, and the distance, or rather the perpendicular distance from the line along which this particle moves to the point A. So this distance right here, that's the distance r. Where can we see such behavior? Because here we don't really have rotation um, in the common sense of the word. There is no object that's rotating. However, this particle can be in motion around this point A in some sort of circular trajectory. And so for a particular fixed moment of time, this particle as we know from before, is essentially moving along a straight line. The next moment of time, the velocity changes direction, the particle is moving along a straight line as well, and so on and so forth. This type of behavior is observed for planets orbiting around stars, or for satellites orbiting around planets. And so, for example, for the Earth, which orbits around the Sun, the angular momentum which is calculated with this relationship here, is always conserved, and that is because there is no external torque that acts on the system Earth-Sun. So that means that if I know the mass of Earth and the distance from the Sun at any moment or any point of the orbit, I could calculate what's the velocity of Earth 
at that particular point of the orbit around the Sun. So here is our Sun. This is the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. It is not circular, it is elliptical. And so when the Earth is at the farthest point from the Sun, then the angular momentum of the Earth will be equal to the mass times the velocity times the distance from the Sun. So the velocity is V1 and the distance from the Sun is R1. Then, when the Earth is right here, closest to the Sun, the angular momentum will be the mass of Earth times the velocity times the distance to the Sun, this distance. And then the velocity here is different as well. However, the two values for the angular momentum are equal. So what is happening here? When the Earth is far away from the Sun, it is moving with small velocity. When the Earth is close to the Sun, it's moving much faster. And so the angular momentum calculated as a particle with respect to a point in space, the point here being the Sun, is conserved because there is no external torque that acts on the system. The last concept that I want to discuss for this lecture is the concept of center of mass. Let's explain what center of mass is. Let's consider an object with a random shape. And this object is a three-dimensional object, something like that. And so if I apply a force F to this object, naturally the object will start to move in the direction of the applied force. If I apply a different force F1 in such a way, then the object will move in the direction of the applied force. Imagine now that I shrink this object so that all of its mass is concentrated at one point in space, such as like a point particle. And then if I apply those same forces as before, this point particle will move exactly the same way as the original object. Well, this point in space where the mass of this big, you know, object is focused that moves exactly the same way as the object under the action of those two forces. That point in space is called the center of mass of this object. Let's give some examples of familiar shapes and where their center of masses are located. So let's start with a sphere. So for a sphere, the center of mass will be located at the center of the sphere. And you can visualize how if a force is applied to the sphere, the sphere will move in the direction of the force. If I focus all of the mass of the sphere at the geometric center of the sphere and the same force is applied to that point, that point will move exactly the same way as the sphere. Let's look at a circle as our next shape. For a circle, the center of mass is right at the center of the circle. For a rectangle, for a rectangle, the center of mass will be at the intersection of the two diagonals. Is it possible to have an object for which the center of mass is outside of the physical object? And the answer is, yes, it is possible, and all depends on how the mass is distributed within the object. So here are two examples. A donut, 
has its center of mass at the geometric center where there is no donut. So it's empty space there. Another example would be some random shape, something like that. And the center of mass can be outside of the actual shape. So what is the importance of center of mass? Well, center of mass has importance for what is known as stability. So imagine a building that has a rectangular shape. Like this. And so we know that the center of mass would be located at the geometric center since this is a um, symmetric geometric form. So the center of mass will be at the geometric center. Okay, this building is not going to be very stable, especially if there are lots of high winds that are hitting the building from a side or if there is a earthquake. What do, I, what do I mean when I say it's not going to be very stable? Consider a similar building, but built in such a way that the center of mass is shifted down, so it's lower, closer to the ground. So if the center of mass is lower, that second building will actually be more stable to being brought down compared to the first building. So if there is a earthquake, the second building with lower center of mass has much higher chance of surviving the earthquake than the building with the higher center of mass. So this is what I mean by stability. Here's a different example. Consider an object that looks like this. So the center of mass of this object is somewhere inside the object. So this object left on its own is pretty stable. Now, if I take similar object, but with this shape, such that the center of mass is outside of the volume of the object itself, well, this object will be unstable. It might require a small push to topple it, or even it might actually fall on its own just because the center of mass is way outside of the volume of the object. So again, this is an example of how the center of mass determines the stability of an object. Center of mass is also important for maintaining balance as you walk. Every person has different position of their center of mass. And so some people are very good at running and through a crowd, such as, let's say, American football, a running back. And then other people are very good at jumping very high, such as basketball players, because their center of mass is higher. And of course... Center of mass has an uh, important role also in the car industry. For sports cars, we want the center of mass to be as low as possible, closest to the ground, in the center of the car, which makes it very agile when it takes turns at high speeds. For regular cars, as we are used to drive, the center of mass is not very low, and so these cars are not very stable when taking turns at high speeds. So the concept of the center of, center of mass is very important for technology and for industry and for building in general. And with this, I will conclude the lecture on rotational motion.